glasses like that are very cool. Yeah. So uh, Shem, I think Mark is probably the most veteran here, and this is what I like about bring. I try to get I try to get a nice uh, mix of people. So so Tori is fresh fresh off the boat, as we say, right out of town. Two years. Two years, and she's um, already been down east and come back. She's been on the air. So she had. Uh, a path where probably a lot of you um, are going to explore in the announcing pathway and some of you in the other pathways too, moving out of town, coming back. Uh, Shem is about seven, seven eight years seven old. Years, seven years, yeah. Oh, pretty mm -hmm. good. So Shem's uh, right um, out of school, interned at KISS and has been there ever since. So he's one of those real small percentages that we talked to you about that uh, leave um, here and go right into the Toronto market and he's done amazing things all over the place there. So he'll talk a little bit about more of his career. Mark's been out, I want to say 12 or 13 years, maybe more? 12. Yeah. Um, and um, Mark was also, just like these guys, a superstar while he was here. Um, I'm not surprised he did TV, because I still remember his TV assignment. I used to teach effective speaking, which you had Neil for. And Mark did a TV assignment, and he just killed it. And I thought, this is a guy who's like a triple threat, because he could public speak. He's great on the radio and he did really great on TV. So that's where his um, path has taken him. I think he started off in radio at News Talk 1010, yeah. and then moved right into Global, was I right about that? Uh, yeah, seven years at 1010, and then the last five so far at, uh, at Global. Yeah. Okay, so they'll talk a bit more about it. Um, uh, so Derek is going to be filming, and um, if, it, if anyone wants to take a picture, you guys are cool with it, and tweeting yeah. it out, and there's their handles sure. on, uh, on Twitter. And, um, yeah, can I just start by maybe um, asking each of you about um, your first break? Uh, actually, let's start right now. Let's let's go back, way back, sort of way back, and mm -hmm. like, yesterday, like yesterday, when you were about five <laughs> weeks out of school, right, finishing. Yeah. Um, if if you were sitting in one of these chairs, what would you be telling um, yourself right now? Start with Mark and Shem and Tori. Sure. Uh, I think I probably would tell myself and tell you guys to just take every any opportunity that comes your way like now is not really the time I think to be picky obviously you just want to get your foot in the door and I know you guys have probably been working to, to do that already up to this point right and maybe you haven't got that foot in the door yet it might be kind of frustrating but don't give up uh, keep trying to do that and as much as I mean, I, I can remember at this time, I had an internship already, and, and I was okay. I'd been working at, at 1010 for a year. It was a, a paid internship. Um, but I remember being frustrated because the, in, the internship was about to run out. I didn't know what was coming up next. But you sort of look at it the reverse way, and, and I think I say this every time I'm here, the, the world is your oyster in many ways, too, because there's so much opportunity out there for you. You're not pigeonholed yet into one sort of category of work or anything like that. So. You know, don't don't get too down on on your prospects at this point, and, and, and take any opportunity that comes its way, even if you're working at three different stations. What the hell? Why not? Right? Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Great, Jim. Yeah, I think at this point, I was I was also uh, interning at Kiss, well, five weeks out. Um, one thing I would say is don't compare yourself to your other classmates. You know, there might be somebody in your class who ends up getting uh, you know a job or an internship somewhere, and you, and you start to stress out. You start to think, "Oh my God, I'm I'm behind." You're not behind or anything of that nature. Uh, you know, there's this there's sort of this pressure to feel like I have to get an internship. You know, like right now, right now. And if I don't, somehow I'm, I'm failing. And it, you're not at all. You know, it just everybody has their own path. And I know that sounds super cliche, but it's also incredibly uh, realistic. And as Mark said, you know, uh, get your foot in the door. Having this pass card, not necessarily this one, but this pass card, is huge um, because it gets you in the building at whether it's Rogers or Chorus or New Cap or wherever. And once you're in the building, I mean, there you have so many different options. You may go in as uh, as as doing promotions, which is actually what I uh, initially went into. But you have access to people who do production, people who do news, people who are on air, things of that nature. So, um, the one of the other big things I can say is really utilize the resources you have around you. You've got you know recent grads who who, who come in. You've got your prof your pro professors who are all in. The, are all in the uh, industry or have been in the industry, they, they can absolutely guide you and tell you what you um, need to do. So, you know, uh, don't get too discouraged. Um, there, there are tons of opportunities out there, even though it's, is it, it can be really frustrating, and I, and I, I know that it can, um, but don't hesitate to reach out and uh, ask for help. Cool, sure. Tori. Um, when I was sitting in your spot, I also was interning at KISS. <laughs> um, and I would just say, well, as I said, most of it, just be hopeful. Because I remember at your point, I was kind of like, 
I don't think I'll be, make it in Toronto right away because it's just so competitive. I mean, Shem's like the one in the <laughs> million type of story. Um, but just be hopeful because even if someone rejects you like 300 times, there's that one person who will take the chance on you and it'll be the best feeling in the world. Um, especially when you get your first like actual like gig gig, it's just like, you're like, all right, pack my bag, see you tomorrow. Like, oh, did I have a family? Who cares? I'm going. Um, but yeah, just be hopeful because like, especially right out of college, it's just like no one wants you, but someone might want you or someone will want you, honestly. Like, but you'll have to get like about 100 no's and then that one person will say yes. Maybe 50 no's, like you never know. It could be one no. I mean, you could be way better than I am. So, you know, just don't be afraid of the word no and don't see it as them saying, you suck, like don't even try. Just see it as there's just so many people, like just in your classroom alone, that are probably all applying for the same job and it's only one job and there's like, 30 of you, so you have to just, never good at math, but one job means one person, so. So from that, maybe just talk a little bit about um, leaving your first job, what you did, and, and kind of a synopsis as to where you are right now, uh, just to kind of take them on your journey. We'll start with like most recent to veteran, how about we that? Mm -hmm. So Tori again. Um, so as I said, I was interning with Blake Mild Show at KISS. I consider that a job because it was a lot of fun. Um, so I was doing that for about eight months and right from there I went to Indy 88, part of their street team for about three months or four months, I'm, I can't remember. Uh, but then my biggest break I would say is I got a morning show gig out in Newfoundland, which yes, it's an island in the middle of the Atlantic and yes, it sounds crazy and yes, it is very crazy to do that. Um, but we were taught to take chances and so I took a chance. I went out there, I learned that Newfoundland is the most gorgeous province I've ever been to. It was an amazing experience. Just, you know, you hear everyone talking about like listeners reacting to you and everything like that and just saying like oh you're great or like your props just saying you're great but when you have like a complete stranger just being like noticing you when you're getting apples at the grocery store when you're just asking them a question one it's freaky but two it's like the coolest thing ever um i was only out there for about four months just because personally and emotionally uh, i'm a i'm a flat a fragile flower i'd like to say um so i had to leave just because i had to do for my health what was best for me because you know jobs and radio are amazing like don't get me wrong like if you want to travel do it but for me I was like you know what I can't do this so I actually went back to Indy because again don't burn any bridges um, because the second I resigned from my position in Newfoundland I called my boss at Indy from Newfoundland told her what happened and about a week later I was on a plane back to Toronto and two days later I restarted my job at Indy and was on their street team in this past summer. And then where I am now, um, this July I got the job as promotion coordinator and weekend slash swing announcer at Country 105. It's not up north, but I'm from Toronto originally, so I say up north um, in Shelburne, which is like Orangeville area. It's like around the corner. Okay, <laughs> you know, like when you're from Toronto, anything north of like Steeles is north. Um, but you know, so up there now, loving it, living the best life, and I'm where I want, like, I remember Sheila said something really important when I was in your position, and that was figure out in life what's most important, whether that's friends, family, work, like what kind of person you are. And though work's very important to me, being close to my friends and family was just that more important. But I made it, and I feel like almost when you have your sights set on something, it makes it that much more attainable because you kind of put it out in the universe. And I said, I'm going to get a job, maybe not in Toronto, but somewhere close enough that I can drive home and do my laundry. And guess what? I have that job. I can do my laundry every week. And it's just, it's a great time. So. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I'd like to revisit also the fragile flower, which we all can be, but like, you know, emotional well-being, mental mm -hmm. health, which is so important, and so many people are afraid of that. So I'll come back to that eventually, but um, let's just carry on with the journey from school. Mr. Yeah, um, so I, I guess as has already been said, I've got a bit of an interesting story. I got my uh, first gig right here in Toronto at Kiss925. Um, if you don't know that station, it's home of the Roz and Mocha Show. Um, and uh, I went in for a promotions job uh, thinking I'd be on the street team because I figured, okay, that's a great way to get in the building. I harassed my PD promo director at the time. 
Um, and I ran into the the then evening show host, a guy named Dave Lazard, uh, into the hall in the hallway. We just struck up a conversation, and then I went on to my interview. Uh, I got the promotions job, but then I got a call from Dave, who said, "Hey, I had a, uh, it was great chatting with you. I'd love to have you um, as my intern." And I thought, "Well, I kind of want to make money, so um, not really." Uh, but then I said to myself, "I really want to be on air," so I decided to take a chance and say no to the promotions job and say yes to the uh, to be his intern. And I was his intern for about six months. Best decision ever because he treated me like a co-host. Essentially, I was on I was on air with him a bunch, pretty much every break we were on air together. Uh, my bosses heard me, said that I was good enough, and they let me be on air in the overnight. And then from there, I got a weekend show, which is what I'm currently doing. And uh, I'm also the assistant music director at Kiss, the music director for um, our Kiss station in Kingston, Ontario, um, the national digital content coordinator for all the Rogers Top 40 stations. Um, there's about. Ten of them or so. I really showed, sold you short. No, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. No, it's really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so I do that. What else? Uh, oh, I run our internship program. Uh, I do quite a bit at, at the radio station, but it's it, it's honestly the best because um, you know in this industry, you know there are very few Roger uh, Roger Ashby's, Marilyn Dennis's, Roz Mocha's who can um, you know be on air for 20, 30 plus years. And, and keep a consistent job. That's a very tough, tough thing to do. So I, I recognized very early on that I needed to be well versed and do a bunch of different things. So um, hence why I have my hat in literally everything right now, uh, from from a national perspective, but also with Kiss Toronto, which has been awesome. Yeah. Can I just ask you a question? Why sure. couldn't you have taken the promotions job and done the like? I know it'd be a 15, 16, 18 hour day, but could you have done both? Um, no, because a lot of the a lot of the promotions gigs were like going to concerts, oh, events okay. at night, and okay. I and uh, the evening show I was on the evening show, so I couldn't do both. It was definitely a calculated risk um, from money perspective, but honestly, the best decision I ever made. It worked out okay. Yeah, it's worked out well, but you know it it. It's it's not I never I never get too big headed about hey look at me I made it out of Toronto super cool <laughs> just because uh, it could be gone in a minute and not that I go into work every day thinking that I'm gonna lose my job but I recognize that this is fleeting and if I don't work super hard one of you guys are gonna come take my job uh -huh. and I prefer that not to be the case um, so you know you never get too high and too low about it you just you keep putting in the work because um, all it takes is a boss to come in and say they want to make a change and. I'm hope my you know my goal is to make it as difficult on them as possible to to, to remove me. So and I you know and that's why you that. do the internships too. If there are any really good ones, you yeah, I just stifle them. <laughs> stifle them. <laughs> no, 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 no. Excellent, thank you, Chef. Mm -hmm. And Mark, too. I know it's a little bit longer of a time, but I'm sure you yeah. remember leaving here and. Well, my journey kind of kind of started at the end of uh, first year. Um, I wanted. I initially wanted to pursue the announcing path, actually, and uh, the guy who was sort of in charge of the announcing classes at that time, uh, he kind of told me I would never be on air. Uh, he, he said that, uh, like he gave me, he, is it still the case where you need 75 to go into announcing the second year? Yeah. So he gave me 76 in announcing and said, you know, if you really want to do it, you know, and work on it, you can, you can go into announcing, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I'd recommend you go into production because I had some uh, experience in music production and stuff before getting into college. Uh, and so I was doing 92 in news and Paul Cross was like, dude, just come, come with me next year, right? And he told me about this internship that was happening at 1010, which you don't have anymore, called the Summer Beat Internship, which it paid 10 bucks an hour. Like, you know, like who's ever heard of a paid internship? So. Uh, I went for it. There was only three spots. I think there was something like 80 odd applicants, so I wasn't expecting much. And I still was, I was going into news because I was very into the news as well. But I wasn't sure, you know, if I if it was really something I desired to work in. And uh, I got the internship. And so for that summer, for those three months, uh, not only was I getting paid to intern at 1010, I was on the air. They were having you do, you know, like um, parades and community events and stuff like that, sort of like the good news stuff. Uh, but that also happened to be what we called the summer of the gun. There was a shooting like every night. I think there was something like 80 homicides that year. So suddenly, you know, you're covering a, a protest at Queens Park during the day, and then it's like, hey, Carcassonne, you want to stay overtime and do the shooting uh, that that just broke? Yeah, sure. So before I knew it, I was doing you know shootings and sort of sometimes being the top story in the newscast. Uh, so once the internship was done that summer. 
they kept me on working part time. Uh, I was doing shifts before school, after school. Sometimes should have been at school, but I was at work instead. Uh, all for the rest of the year. And uh, when I graduated, uh, stuck around at 1010 for a bit, uh, but they told me there was really no room to give me full-time work, and the news director said, you know, if you want a full-time job, be free, go. So uh, I did what I could at 1010. I was doing some shifts on weekends at their affiliate in Hamilton as well uh, to make sort of four or five days a week. And then I got a job in uh, Cornwall uh, as a newscaster there would have been a Monday to Friday thing. I say would have been because the, the day I signed on the dotted line to take the job and was convinced, okay, I, I'm moving out to Cornwall, I gotta find a place to live. Uh, I got a call from the guy who was the news director at 1010 at the time, Dave Trafford, and he said, uh, listen, one of our reporters is pregnant, we got a mat leave position opening up, uh, we'd love to have you back full time for a year. So I took it. Cornwall news director was pissed at me. But <laughs> what are you gonna do, right? Uh, and uh, after a year of doing that mat leave thing, they found room to, to keep me. So I worked uh, as a reporter, anchor, uh, produced a couple shows at 1010 over that time. I, I, I worked for two years as an assistant producer for a show George Strombolopoulos had on the station, which was pretty awesome. Um, uh, even, you know, filled in hosting some of the shows not any of the talk shows because reporters shouldn't have opinions, but uh, you know just some of the news recap shows and stuff like that. And uh, then in 2012, I was covering the Michael Rafferty trial in London, and I got an email from again my former news director at 1010, who is now the managing editor at Global, and said, uh, "Hey, we're looking for somebody. You know, I I can't offer you the job straight out, but I'd I'd like you to throw your hat into it." And so I I had no inclination really to do TV at all, but. I thought, what the heck, let's give it a shot again, right? Just like the, the news thing. And uh, threw my hat in there, applied, and after I think it was four job interviews in three months, uh, they were really doubtful as to why they should hire some radio guy instead of people who had done TV already. Uh, but after all that time, I, I ended up getting the job, and uh, here I am now. So, Ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark, one of your visits here a long time ago, and this is going to play into the emotional health, emotional well-being. <clears throat> I remember you telling the students, yeah. you think the deadlines are tight now, oh, wait yeah. until you're out there. Yeah. Um, do you still think it's the case? Do you still think that, uh, that and you can all address this too, that um, the pace here, although mm. you have eight classes and deadlines versus one focused deadline, mm -hmm. um, is it equally as stressful? Should they prepare themselves for a bit more of a challenge, or is, is this a good enough prep for what they're in store for? It, it's 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 good it's good prep in general, like the basics, the framework. But I think the the analogy I, I made is that you know, like when you do for those of you who are in the news pathway, for example, when you do an assignment for Paul Cross and he gives you a week to do a 30 second rap, like that is beyond the scope of reality. The truth is most times you have half an hour to an hour to do a rap. Shave off some minutes from that, you know, if you're filing from the field and they have to trans transfer it into the system and everything. So you're, it's bang, bang, bang. And nowadays, uh, I don't know if it's more stressful, but there are more deadlines because there's, there's no such thing as just a radio reporter or just a TV reporter anymore. You know, if you're working for a radio station, the base of what you do is, yeah, you're filing for the radio station, but you're filing video reports for the website. You're typing up print stories for, for the website as well. So you've got multiple deadlines that you've got to follow. And, you know, that shouldn't scare you because with time, you learn to, to meet those deadlines. I'm not trying to scare anybody. Uh, but it, 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 you will notice once you get out there and you're working, it's like, yeah, that, I don't have nearly the amount of time I had in class. I know what I'm doing because I had class, but now I've got to learn how to sort of meet that pace. And it comes with time. You'll miss slots. You'll miss deadlines. You might get yelled at here and there, but whatever. It happens. So what are the tools for that kind of stress? So for you guys trying to keep up with it now, knowing that it could be a little bit of a, a more quicker pace until you get adapted to that, what are some of the tools y'all use to meet those deadlines and to not get too stressed out by that? I'll start. Um, well, me doing promotions and announcing, right now I'm doing the morning show because uh, one of our morning guys is taking a vacation, which is lovely for him. Um, 
but yeah, it's just kind of, I'm per someone who's very visual, so I'll like put a whole on checklist of the day, what needs to get done, put it priority, what needs to get done by this time, and just kind of do it. Like, you know, I'll take my lunch break as I'm doing things. I mean, taking breaks is very important, but I kind of prioritize what will take me longer, what's this, what's that. Um, and being an announcer specifically, I, I've never done the newsy newsy stuff and that's just like bam 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 Doug Ford's doing this Doug Ford's doing that and it's just like five every five minutes something's happening but it comes to a case where you know oh our midday girl called in sick we need to do middays I get to work at 10 o'clock middays for us starts at 11 so I gotta just prep and just go for it and I mean this the I would say this definitely preps you a good amount um, as an announcer at least um, but you do have those slightly more stressful days where things are just thrown at you and you just you just have to do them because that's your job and the radio station won't go around unless you do those things like radio stations not just gonna stop all of a sudden because you're like you know I don't feel like doing my show today like we're just gonna let the music play and yeah the music will play but if you don't do your breaks when you're supposed to be doing your breaks you know your PD's on the phone saying where the hell are you like it's a bit a more at stake there's a lot more at stake you know like money you know your rent <laughs> groceries um, just living in general uh, I don't know your situations as to whether you're living at home not living at home whether you already know what it feels like to pay rent and all this stuff um, but when I was in your seat, I still lived at home because you got to milk the parents as long as you can. Um, but now I live by myself and you know, like the reality is, as Shem says, like you don't go to work every day saying, oh my God, they're going to fire me today. Though we joke about it a lot because it's just fun to joke that you're going to get fired. Um, but you always go in being like, if I'm not great today, like yeah, everyone has an off day, but if I just constantly put on a crap show every weekend, like they're gonna be like, why did we hire you? Like yeah, sure, promotions are great at that, but you just again, you have to be like Sheila was calling Mark a triple threat. You gotta be, even if it's not you know good at TV, you have to be a triple threat in some way. Like I'm really strong with our website because as they call me the. Um, resident millennial at my station because everyone else is much older than me which is totally fine because I'm running the website doing all the social media doing promotions doing my show doing other people's show and it's kind of just like oh just you just kind of do it and yep. lists uh, sorry I was going very off track to your question yes I was about to reel you in sorry it's okay uh, it's just okay make a, a list. visual is good lists make a are list good. and yes. just know like you'll I'm like this program teaches you what's important and once you know the brand of your station you'll know what needs to get done first obviously and what could take a bit of a back seat so kind of just know how to prioritize that way okay. and make lists i'm a list lady you know grocery lists all of them just Thank lists you. cool Shem. I'm gonna be honest. I kind of forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My okay. Well, ten minutes ago, stress. we asked. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. I'm right. Stressed right now. Now it's really good. I'm kidding. She was in the program too. Oh, That's right. great. Um, we have okay. a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're so enough. to deal with deadlines. Okay. okay. So we're talking about stressors in mm -hmm. radio. And you know we have stressors in class and school, and then there's a different set. So how does every what does everybody do to deal with them? So you know Tori's a less I'm a less person too. I have to understand what I'm doing. So does yeah. she? What do you guys do? Well, uh, I don't have murders to deal with. I have Kylie Jenner pregnancies and things of that nature to deal with on a on a consistent basis. So for me, everything is show prep. So I'm 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 constantly on Twitter. Like I mean, like a lot of people are, and then social media. So anything that I see that I think might be interesting, quite honestly, I have a folder um, in my email, and I just kind of toss it in there because uh, it can get very overwhelming being in a on a pop culture radio station, for example, where everything is needs. No longer is it just you know Kardashians, Bieber. It's anything is pop culture. Trump is pop culture, right? I mean, anything is, right? So. Um, for me, in, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of keeping track of everything, I just jot down everything. I'm really, really big on doing that. Uh, in terms of my music responsibilities, I, I just try to keep my ear to the ground in terms of, uh, you know, what's out there musically. I've, I've, I'm pretty sure I have uh, mobile notifications for, like, every single artist, which is, I would recommend not doing that because that would drive you <laughs> insane but when i know that an artist is going to drop a, an album or a record i'll i'll turn those, i'll turn those uh, those notifications on so that 
we're on it. And something that I pride myself on because I'm I have so many digital responsibilities for not just Kiss Toronto but um, the Roger stations across the country is I like to be first, but I also like to be accurate. Of course, um, I like for our audience to uh, expect that when a new mu when new music drops our new music video drops that they can get it from us. I mean, obviously we're never gonna compete with Spotify and Apple Music and those, those streaming services, but in terms of you know the other radio stations in our market, I want people to note that you can come to Kiss Toronto, we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna uh, hear about the new stuff first from us. So I'm constantly on, um, uh, on social media, but I will say this, uh, work-life balance is so, 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 so important, and I am the worst at it. I freely admit that I am way too plugged in, um, and I need to, I have to really tell myself sometimes to just check out, and sometimes it's, it's hard because you feel like, <laughs> Man, the second I check out, of course, something breaking news is going to happen, and then I and then I'm screwed, right? Um, and uh, I would say, uh, if you can have work-life balance, that'll definitely help with your stress, with your stress levels. Uh, what you do here is so important, of course, and take take this stuff seriously. Uh, we were just, we were uh, as Kylie was sort of showing us around. You guys have some ridiculously awesome facilities, yeah. <laughs> like ridiculous, um, like better than some radio stations that I've seen in in, in this market, which is wild. Um, take advantage of those. I mean, if those studios are empty, that's a problem, in my opinion, right? Uh, those studios should never be empty. They should always be filled with you guys going in there, practicing, honing your craft. You may think you know, and I don't mean this in a bad way, you may think you know, you think you, you may say to yourself, I'm good, I got it, no problem, easy. But I promise you, the more reps that you take, the better it will, you better you will uh, be at it. And again, those studios should never, ever, 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 ever be empty. You should always be on it. And um, believe it or not, that will help with your stress level. The more you become comfortable with honing your craft, whether it's on air, whether production, whether it's news or, or anything like that nature, um, you will you will find yourself a hell of a lot more comfortable. But if you just are kind of having a lack of lazy attitude about it, you don't really care. Well, you know, what you put in is what you're gonna get out, right? So out of it. So just sort of be mindful of that and really as I said, take advantage of these ridiculous facilities you guys have. Okay, so so lists, um, living the job so it doesn't overwhelm you, you're kind of as you go. Mm -hmm. Um, but understand that there's a work life balance yeah. um, and honing your craft so you have more confidence which is less stressful. Mm -hmm. And Mark. Uh, I do have murders to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the tough one, in all seriousness, right? Yeah. Like, that's another level that a lot of people aren't dealing with. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it, I think it's a personal thing in many ways, um, detaching yourself from stuff like that. I know a lot of reporters who, who take um, things like that very, you know, it takes a, a heavy emotional toll on them. Um, I'm, I guess I'm good with de detaching myself from, from that story and not getting emotionally caught up in it. Is it sad when a child dies? Yes, of course, but you know, it's, it's, it's I've never cried at a scene or anything like that, uh, but you know, you, you, you take those things in stride, and I think just over time, too, I've, I've developed ways to kind of handle them a little bit better. Um, I'm not a list guy. Uh, to me, it's, I sort of keep it all in my head, what I have to do and when I have to do it and who I have to talk to and what I've got to ask and all that. Uh, but in terms of, of, of dealing with the, with the stress from that, my way of sort of going about it is when I'm working, whether it's an eight hour shift or a 16 hour shift or whatever it ends up being, like I'm all in, 200%, you know, my, my mind is devoted to, to what I'm doing and I work, I work my butt off. But I've become very good, especially in, in the last five, six years, I would say, uh, maybe less of, of when, when work is done, it's done. I'm detached, I'm disconnected. Uh, like Shem said, work-life balance is, is, is a big thing for me. I hang out with my friends, uh, I like to go to the gym, I like to play hockey, uh, anything to just not be working. Uh, and I, I think that's important in, in staying sane. Uh, you know, when, when, you're, when you're first starting it, uh, you know, you definitely want to be as connected as you can because you're trying to impress people. And not that I'm not now 13 years into it, but uh, you, you just sort of, naturally learn I find just to kind of you know better better balance your life you, your body tells you what you need to do and your mind tells you what you need to do and, and, and you do it good good advice so I think um, I'm just gonna open it up because I know you guys have a lot of questions too um, so I'll just moderate and and uh, we'll go from there okay so who wants to start as someone that's willing to move you know, as far as I need to um, something I've always struggled with is I'm not sure how I can afford it. Like, I don't know how, in terms of, like, I've got 100 bucks to my name right now on top of student loans. Um, Preach, join clubs. So, yeah. so, like, 
when I'm when I'm done here and best case scenario I get offered a job somewhere far, like how do I if I can't afford to move, like how do I take that? It's, it's something that I, I don't there's a gap there, I'm not sure. Well I can't do that. Yeah. I moved. Um when I moved to Newfoundland specifically, because they knew what they're getting themselves into, actually they flew me out to Newfoundland um, about a month before they even offered me the job just to see if I even liked it there. Um, and Kyle Taylor, who is one of the greatest guys ever, if you, you, I'm assuming you guys had him. Yes. I know he's terrifying, but he's great. Okay, I'm glad you guys think that too. I was so scared of him, and then I finally talked to him, realized he was great. Um, but he always told me, if someone's going to fly you somewhere, the worst that can happen is you get a free trip, trip to Newfoundland. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, but as to affording it, I feel like most students are kind of in the same boat where you know, I don't know if you have a job right now, but I I was working two jobs plus going to school while I was in, at Humber, and then coming out of Humber, I actually just because I was working for the school and you know school ends, um, I was out of any job, like not even a part timer for about three four months, and that was stressing me out because I like money and shopping. Um, but eventually I got that part-time job and moving out there, they're very helpful. They put me up in a hotel for about three weeks just so I could find you know, a place to stay. I could be comfortable, not only with the station itself, but just like I'm in a brand new province. Mm -hmm. And also it was the dead of winter and Newfoundland winters are not fun. Mm -hmm. Like I would just like to put that out there. Um, but financially, I'm not gonna say don't worry about it, um, but everyone in radio has kind of been there, especially if you've traveled in radio, and they're very understanding. Not obviously you can't pay your rent type of thing, but they, they'll help you get on your feet, basically is what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, and they'll definitely push you. So if you're a lazy person, get unlazy if you want to move, because you do have to bust your ass like anywhere to find a place and to move in and get that sorted. But yeah, they, they're, I, I mean, I've only technically really, really moved once, but they were super understanding and very, like they wanted to make sure that I was making the right choice for me, um, which I feel, and I've heard other people who've moved for their job say the same thing. Everyone in radio is kind of in the same boat, so they understand where you're coming from type of thing. Yeah, I've had somebody uh, who I know that moved out uh, West say that they just um, they were upfront with the program director and just asked if they could help out with like, moving expenses. So that's something to potentially bring up as well. If you're in negotiations with uh, somebody, obviously do it in a tactful way. Don't be like you need to move me out. But um, you know they might give you an advance in your salary or whatever the case may be, right? So don't be afraid to sort of have those have those kind of conversations. Because I mean, yeah, it's not it's not easy. You, you know, you're moving out on your own or whatever to a different place by yourself. Have those conversations and be open and honest. But Mark, did you were you aware of any of your uh, classmates who did that and had any challenges? Uh, none that had challenges in my class. A lot of them, like we had, I don't know if you remember Ryan Balser. Is he? Yeah. He moved out to Northwest Territories. Uh, wow. Yeah, quite, quite a few of my classmates moved for work, and some of them are still living, you know, outside of Toronto. Toronto, and I don't recall any of them really having any, any problems. In fact, I, I recall a lot of them telling stories like Shem where you know, they, they received some assistance in, in moving or were given some extra time to find a place. Uh, so I don't know if you'll encounter too many problems. It doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. Right. Thank you guys. Thanks. This is kind of a theory crafting question. So say your first gig was you got hired at Classical. This is open for everyone. What would you do? <laughs> so, you know, it's a movie Classical. That's kind of what I like. Um, Depends. Are you doing on air? Or yeah. You... What's the position? Oh, um, I guess promotions to start because it's like getting your foot in the door kind of deal. Uh, um, Steve Couch doesn't work here anywhere, right? Hmm. No. Okay. Um, I had a professor, Steve Couch, who was here, uh, who said, you know, don't don't go to a station if you don't like if you don't like the music or mm. so, something along those lines, and. Um, I was like, oh, I don't really know if I agree with that. <laughs> um, honestly, if you if a if a classical station, to use your example, said, "Hey, we want you to come work promotions," I think you'd be crazy not to. Yeah. Like, if you if you're gonna just if you're into, let's say, you know, um, top forty or or urban music, and you and you only ever want to work for those radio stations, and and you say no to others. Um, I don't. I, I I would question whether you really want this as a whole. Not you in particular, yeah, Brett, of course. No. But anybody who who 
who took that line of thinking. I understand from an on-air perspective what I have challenges working at a classical radio station, probably, because I think there, there does need to be a level of authenticity when you're talking on the radio. Um, and I, I, I couldn't sell Beethoven to you even if I tried. I really I couldn't. Could <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I could. Um, but if it's a job, if it's when you're starting out, and if it's, if it's something in promotions, oh my God, go for the experience because uh, promotions teams are are very similar. They have a lot of very similar sort of. Um, uh, responsibilities, uh, whether it's promotions or production, you know, you're learning the business. So get your feet wet and learn the business. And you can go to you can go to a station, and be there for six months or a year. You don't have to be there for the rest of your career, right? You go there and you get this, you get this experience. Because one of the more frustrating things I know is you'll go to a job interview fresh out of school and they'll be like, well, you don't have experience. Well, how am I supposed to get experience if you don't give me the chance to get experience, mm -hmm. right? So it it can be super frustrating uh, at times. Um, so I say take the experience. For sure. From, from a networking perspective too, right? I mean, you're going to meet people there who may not always work there. You're, mm -hmm. You may not always work there, but you'll always have connections that could get you in somewhere else or that you could help get somewhere else, right? It's uh, It doesn't hurt. Um, yeah, I don't know a lot of people who have started exactly, yeah. from 17 years teaching now, who have started exactly where they wanted to. Maybe Shem. And a couple other people, but overall, like you want to you want to have that you know that uh, experience, right? That well-rounded experience yeah. for sure. Um, so, in terms of knowing yourself, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and then you get into an internship, and say uh, somebody approaches you with a task to do, but you know that that's part of your weakness. When is it, when do you, where do you draw the line in terms of just saying no to that position or just saying yes to that, or do you just dive in straight ahead into the deep end? Dive in, there's no line. Just go for it. Yeah. Yeah, because if it's a weakness, the only way to strengthen it is to keep going at it like anything in life. Yeah. Like how do you get good at driving a car? You just drive a car. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you just try it and never be afraid to ask questions. That's the most like, that was my thing with Kyle Taylor. I was terrified to ask him a question. Asked him my first question, best time ever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just never be afraid to ask a question. Even if you think it's a stupid question, because there are no stupid questions. Even if like secretly I think it's a stupid question, there really are. <laughs> you know what, in the end, as long as you're helping it, because I would rather you do the job right mm -hmm. than mess it up the first time, and then we have to backtrack and try to fix it. Yeah. So yeah, just ask questions, go for it. Okay. So the question for all three of you is you guys kind of got your start with internships and you talked about getting your foot through the door. I think a lot of us are doing that right now and kind of making the jump from station to station. What would you recommend for us to do when we're there other than when we have a meeting with someone, pick their brain. But if we have additional time afterwards, do you suggest that we just stay there and just not harass people but ask them for more information? Yeah, that, that's one of the things. Uh, but even just in the various tasks you're assigned, I think it's just important to to actually do it and like try to do your your best and make an impact that way, right? Like I, I can I can even think of, you know, now that I'm a, a veteran, as Sheila put it, um, you know, I've, I've worked with many interns, uh, and there are a lot of interns I remember because they did such a great job when they were asked. Um, not that they were, I don't want to say that 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 they were, you know, basically doing slave work or anything like that, but. You know, they, they did what they were asked, and they did it well, and they had a passion for it, and you could tell they were passionate about it. They asked questions, but another key thing, key advice, piece of advice that, that I'll give you is when you have an internship, like introduce yourself to people, meet people. Don't be, because there's so many interns that, that pass through even now at Global who, uh, usually it's a six week internship, and you see them, you don't know who they are. Uh, sometimes you even say hi to them, and you just get sort of like a, you know, like they don't want to talk to you. And six weeks goes by and no one knows who that was and their time is done and that's it. There's been no impact left whatsoever. So many of our EAs and, and, and people who get hired are former interns who, who made Sorry, an impact. EA? Uh, editorial, editorial assistant, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, they're the ones who, for example, if, I'm, if I am in Brampton and then I need an interview done in, in Markham, uh, I, can, I can send them with a list of questions. Can you please ask these for me? Anyway, um, yeah, just you know, be, be visible, be present. Do the work that's asked of you, and, and and show some passion about it. Can I just ask something though? And, and you probably yeah. all have experienced this. When your those interns aren't speaking up, um, do you ever attribute it to the fact that like 50% of the population is introverts, and it's it's they want to so desperately, but they're so afraid to. And if that's yeah. the case, 
as I'm sure a lot of people in here might be, might be that person who really wants to make an impact but is scared out of their minds of how to do that. Mm -hmm. How else can they do that other than putting their hand forward and shaking? Chan, what do you think? So, okay, so I think, um, I don't like internships where they just like put you in a room and just tell you to get coffee because I don't think yeah. you learn anything from that, right? So I think what you have to do is you got to go into these places and see if you can identify what uh, a radio station needs um, because I guarantee you there are people, we are all working with 10 different hats on and sometimes we can just use a hand. So if you can identify, so let's say you're going in and you're working for an announcer. If you can, you know, identify maybe another announcer that might need something, just offer some help. Just say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to help if you need it. Um, that's kind of how you will, um, you'll really sort of grow. A, a perfect example, there was a guy named uh, Jesse Blake who came in as an intern on uh, the Adam Wilde show and uh, again as an intern now he runs Adam has his big podcast Steve Dangle podcast I don't know yeah. if you guys ever listened to that um, and now Jesse moved on from being from just being an intern to now being the social media guy for Tim and Sid um, and he and all he did was ask questions ask questions ask questions ask who needed this um, identify different strengths and weaknesses that people ha I had and and tried to capitalize on that because again I guarantee you if you go into a building um, whether it's Rogers or it's Chorus or Bell and you ask hey, is there anything I can help you with? It could be literally anything. Anything I can help you with, somebody will say yes. And if you can continue to do that, you will. I, I, really, I really feel like you can make the most out of your internship experience. I know it's not easy going up to you know, um, people who you might see on air or, or program directors. You might be slightly intimidated, but uh, they've all been where, you, where you're at. We've all been where you're at, right? I think maybe everybody understands that it takes a lot to get into this industry sometimes. Um, so don't hesitate to do it. Uh, I know it's hard. I definitely know that it's hard. And now that you know you have the three of us here, if you need advice, ask us. We can we can you know best be able to sort of guide you and, and, and get you to um, answer the ask the questions that you need to ask in order to help your career, right? So. And is it fair to say you do it once you you get that courage just to oh go my to one God. person oh, and say, just... do you need any help? And then run away. Just it's like oh. I didn't collapse, I didn't yeah. pass out, and then it gets easier. Is that fair to say that, that oh, just doing sure. it that one time just and one getting time. that nerve? Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. cool. As someone who went into radio and then went into a more multimedia uh, centric platform, uh, how would you find the transition between those two? Like having to go from from just being on, uh, to dealing with a, a radio environment and then going into maybe television or even online video. Yeah. Oh. It's, uh, it wasn't that hard, to be honest. Um, and I thought it would be daunting. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, like just comparing radio and TV, uh, just the two of those first off. There's, there's a lot of similarities between the two. I mean, radio, you're telling shorter stories. You've got to paint more of a picture with your voice. Uh, TV, the stories are a bit longer, but you've still got to write to pictures. Like, it doesn't just help to have the pictures on the screen you got to sort of tell people what they're looking at, right? But, you know, very much the writing is still the same. You've still got to be concise. And in fact, uh, the experience I had in radio, I think, kind of kind of helped with many of those things uh, in terms of effective writing. Um, you know, I, I'm just looking at this purely from a reporter standpoint. I know you're in production. Um, but, you know, the, the work of reporting, doing interviews and stuff is, is all the same. So it wasn't that difficult, the most difficult part was not being so bloody awkward on camera when I first started and making weird faces and not knowing what to do with my hands and, you know, um, but I, I think there's a lot of, I hate using this term, but there's a lot of synergy, it's a, it's a corporate buzzword that I've heard a million times and I can't stand, but between different types of media now because, like I said, and like you said, it's, a, it's very much a multimedia environment. So if you're working for a TV station, you still got to file stuff sometimes for your radio affiliates. We have a radio affiliate at 640. Uh, we're still writing up stories for our websites as well. And that was something I started doing even when I was at 1010. So again, it's just a type of work that I sort of brought over with me. So I don't want to say it's all the same, but making the transition from one medium to another is not as difficult as you might think it is, honestly. If you had the opportunity to travel back in time to the day after your classes were done. If you had the opportunity to whisper one piece of advice into your own ear, what would it be? 
Oh, I think I would tell myself to. Uh, sorry, your voice is just. Um, I think I would tell myself to never be discouraged, um, because before I did get my big break, I got told that I was second, which is like a slap in the face. That's like the women winning silver in the Olympics. Like, you know what I mean? So. That was probably the most discouraging, like hitting rock bottom before I even got a job thing because like, I'd rather you just say I didn't get a job, but that was the fire I needed to tell me, okay, though I got second, that really, really sucks. Uh, they're gonna regret it forever because I'm not petty at all. Um, <laughs> it showed me that I'm almost good enough for them, which means I'm definitely good enough for someone else. So just always remember, though you might, not necessarily you're good enough, but there's just so much competition. So. If you can get almost that job, though it freaking sucks when they say, you know, call me in a year, then you know. And I know everyone in this room will have that ability to, someone's going to want you. There's always someone you just got to find. So that's, though I talked it, that was my whisper, but I wanted everyone to hear it. So thanks. You no, know, what I would tell myself, honestly, is to is to just prepare to, uh, it, you know, encounter some roadblocks. You know, there, there are going to, there's going to be some no some no's I'm, I'll never forget my my grade was I feel like my graduating year was pretty good like we had a, we had a pretty good year we also had some people who part of my language thought their ish didn't smell right and they thought that they could they thought that they were stars right right away yeah, like it. before <laughs> before yeah, anything awesome. right and that's a very dangerous way of thinking it's great to be confident nothing wrong with that but you've got to be prepared to you know to really prove yourself especially when you are um, first coming out, you know, you know, you have to prove yourself. You just do. So be prepared for that, and be prepared that sometimes, you know, uh, you might think you were number one here uh, here at Humber, but you start out at the bottom of the totem pole, and that's not a bad thing. Look at that as a challenge. Look at that as a way to say, all right, cool. Now I've got some room that I uh, some room to grow, and um, just so one thing I wish I would have told myself, really, is you know, prepare for some no's, prepare for, you know, prepare for some rejection. And yes, I know I got my start in Toronto, I've been here since then, it's been great. Um, but as I said to you before, I never let that, I never, ever, ever, ever let that um, uh, inflate my ego because you got students like yourself, anybody here who can take this, take my position at any time. So stay humble, really stay humble uh, and work, 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 work really hard. Nice. Thank you. And of course. More. I think I would just tell myself, don't worry about it, because uh, I, 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 when I when I graduated, you know, while I had the internship and, and and all that, it was coming to an end, and I was pretty worried about what the future held. I thought, yeah, I've got this great internship, but there's nothing there's nothing right there in front of me right now. Oh my God, I went through two years of school and I worked, and and now what? And I, you know, I, I started doubting whether there would be anything out there, but there was, right? And, and things worked out, and. Uh, if you're if you're dedicated to it and, and you you know you really want to do it, you, you will find a way. Yeah. I mean, or or someone will find you. Um, so I, that's what I would tell myself: just don't don't worry too much. That's you know. small stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're down the road, um, how do you know when to say yes to taking on more um, stuff? Right. So you have your sort of you're in, say you have an announcing gig, right? You're you know Monday to Friday or whatever or weekends, and someone approaches you with more, and you're like, okay, like not too sure how to make it work or is it too much or when do you know if it's too much um so just when do you know how to take on more so i guess that's that work-life balance how do you know if it's going to yeah, be out of control right do you want to you want to progress you wanna, yeah right? you want to yeah. take on more but you don't want to let it consume you yeah um yeah well again i, I probably worst day I, I to really answer this question because i'm taking on way too much right now <laughs> um <laughs> But there was a point where I had to I had to say no because I knew that if I took on that job, it would affect negatively all the other stuff that I was doing. So I think you have to be able to be honest with yourself, quite frankly, and and say, all right, if I'm going to take this, is this going to be valuable? Am I going to am I going to gain a skill, or is that going to lessen my skills in the other areas that I'm currently working on? Right. So it, there's really no time frame. It's just more of a feeling. Uh, uh, type of deal. I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, no, no question. Would it be good to set? Like, could you guys still set goals where it's, if that's working toward the goal that you want, you yeah. would take it on. But if it's not, then uh, you don't do it. Yeah, hundred percent. I I have a goal, I have a goal of becoming a program director one day. We well, pretty much are without the title. That's what it, I can tell. Yes, but <laughs> and, it, and it sucks without the title. It does. <laughs> um, but yeah. Sure.
I definitely, definitely would like to become a program director one day, and I'm I'm gonna say yes to the things that are gonna let me, you know, get to that, um, you know, get to that end goal. And if it's something that I feel like isn't, then I'm just gonna say no to it. And but I'm not gonna just be, you know, I'm not gonna be an ass about it. And I'm gonna say no for this reason because I don't feel like it helps me get to this goal. And quite frankly, if you are working for a company that doesn't really understand that and is just almost bitter and mad, then I think you know it might be time to rethink where you are because most companies should, in theory, have your best interest at heart. Sure. Anything to add or? Um, I would just say, like for me personally, I fell in love with promotions, especially getting this job where I actually was the boss of someone, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, but I fell in love with promotions and I know down the road that is what I want my main focus to be. But I think the one thing you do have to remember in taking on other jobs is if you have multiple jobs, like all of us do, just remember what those jobs are. I never forget that I'm an announcer and I never say, well, I want to do prom promotions so my show doesn't matter. Or even if you're an announcer and you do promotions, like, I just want my show to be the best. It doesn't matter if the promotions suck. It doesn't matter if they're successful. Like, just always remember, even though you have your end goal of where you want to be in the future, just always remember if you're wearing all these hats, just remember you're wearing them. Never forget those hats because you know maybe you'll take off a hat but one hat will grow I guess like a larger brim I guess is a good analogy because um, down the road I'd love to just be the promotions director and that be my title because I love promotions but yeah um, just know your limits to answer the original question and focus on what you want for the future but also don't forget what you currently have like don't don't live in the future, which is the best thing. Live in the now, which I think is good life advice just in general. Good. All the all the professionals are saying, if you want to work and hone your craft, you got to get out of Toronto. We keep hearing that. What other than that can you tell us that you think would be like just gold advice? You guys are in a particular space right now where, where you've got a lot of opportunity to, to make your own stuff too, right? You don't necessarily, if you can't, find a radio station to work at for whatever reason uh, or TV station or what have you um, <laughs> you're so free to make your own thing at this point which is crazy I mean in in, in 2050 or 2006 sorry when I graduated podcasting I, I think it was a thing but it wasn't like a thing that just the average everyday person did it was you know you had to be somebody to have a podcast or a podcast was like a shortened version of a show that already existed uh, so, I mean, yes, moving away is, is, a, is a way to get experience, you know, work-wise and life-wise, but uh, I think, you know, you, you've got so many opportunities to, to make your own thing and hone your own craft at home and at the same time generate listeners while doing it, right, by uploading it somewhere. Yeah, that's good yeah. advice. Mm -hmm. Anything else that's consistent that, you know, would, you guys have heard in your short career but your longer career, Shem? Oh wow. Um, yeah, I, I guess I guess you know as I said before, it's it's um, specifically if you're being if you're on air, uh, you've got to practice. Uh, you may think you know your voice, and I and I've been on air at Kiss now for seven years, and I'm just sort of developing an understanding of who Shem is on the radio, which is crazy considering it's been seven years, but. Um, it, it takes practice. I started out doing one show a week, which is doesn't allow for a lot of consistency. You know, now I'm doing uh, I'm doing a lot more uh, a lot more than that. But kind of like Mark said, what's to stop you from you know using your H two Zoom? Is that, is that still a thing? <coughs> right? Yeah, your H two Zoom and or or whatever it is, and recording a show and and uploading it to YouTube or whatever the case is, and just and air checking yourself or getting a friend to air check. You know, you have to practice it. If you don't practice. There's no, there's no way that you're going to get better. You know, I, I, I know a lot of kids um, who have come, who have left Humber. You know, they want to be on air. They're not really doing anything. They're just sort of relying on the same air check that they had when they were here at Radio Humber. And I'm like, well, what have you done to improve <coughs> since then, right? Um, and again, with today's technology, if there's so many, you don't have to be at a radio station to, to, to get your practice to hone your skills. You don't have to do that. You have your, you know, you have. Uh, other devices and other mediums that you can get your stuff through so and again ask for feedback ask for feedback I still get Humber students so, since I've graduated who will send me uh, their stuff all the time asking for feedback asking for uh, advice on how they can make their stuff sound better you know ask ask professionals who are who are in the industry and who are willing to help 
Sure, and if you're given all of them, like these guys are giving you, you know, you have to you have to grab that. We're very lucky that our grads continue to give back, right? Mm -hmm. We do have barriers. Mine, I have uh, medical barriers. How do we try and get ourselves to be the yes man, even though we have these barriers? Mm. You know, it's new, and, and this is probably something that um, you guys wouldn't deal with necessarily yet unless you're in management. Yeah. But we are seeing, uh, thank God, uh, people who have um, accommodations being recognized and supported, no matter what yeah. it is, medical, emotional, etc. Um, I don't know if it's actually transitioned well enough into the, the real world, right? So I think that's a really excellent question because although here you're given the support, are you going to be given the support out there and be able to perform the job? That's really good. What do you guys think? That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Mm. That's a good question. Mm. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I can't speak from experience. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not living your experience, right? So I don't have any barriers per se myself, but I think, like Sheila said, it's something that in, in the industry is, is becoming much more accommodated. Uh, and I, I don't think that any good manager would ever push more on you than you're willing to, to handle. You, you know, you may be asked to do something, but I think you know, if it's something that conflicts with whatever your barrier is, I can't see them trying to force you into doing it or, or telling you do it or we're going to let you go. Uh, you know, I, I, there's certainly, you know, between um, Bell Let's Talk and various other initiatives too, it, it's becoming a bigger thing, not just in broadcasting, I think in sort of the corporate world in, in general, right? So I, I would, again, I can't speak from experience, but I would, I would think that it would be something that would be better accommodated. I can't picture anyone in this day and age telling you or holding you back because you can't physically or mentally do something. Yeah. And, and not to sound, I hope this doesn't sound insensitive in any sort of way, you know, um, you know, you know yourself better than anybody else, right? So you know your strengths, so lean on those. Don't, you know, as much as you can, don't lean on, don't, don't try your best not to lean on uh, those perceived, those barriers that you feel like you have, right? I mean, uh, you turn those into strengths, and, and you showcase, you know, uh, a boss or whomever it is that you're you're good. Bluntly, and this might be getting a little too dark, and you'll see why I'm going to say no pun intended. I used to think that being a black man might be a pun, might might be uh, a barrier for myself getting into the industry. Bluntly, there's very few of us in my building, um, and very few of us on air in Toronto, right? I mean, I, I'd be hard pressed to ask anybody if they can identify people of color on air. It's, 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 it's a rarity, right? And I used to think that would be, would be a bearer, but the second I sort of uh, stepped away from that line of thinking and I started saying, no, you know what? Like being a black man and being cultured and being what I, what I have, it, I have, uh, you know, those are strengths, right? Whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're a woman, whether you're, you know, gay, whether you're, you know, whatever the case is, you know, uh, identify those as strengths and don't don't view them as, as barriers as much as you can. Certain, I know that there are certain things that you can't help, but, um, you know, I, as I say, try your best to turn them into strengths is, is what I would say. And and Mark says uh, quite eloquently, any, any manager or boss who is going to um, hold you back because of that is... Probably not one worth working for, yeah. I would say. Yeah. That's good advice. Um, and I hope this isn't going to sound um, at all <coughs> detrimental to anyone's barriers, but do you think there's an onus on, the, on a person who might have some needs for support to be transparent about those needs so that if the job requires something and they know they can't meet it, that it's not fair to everybody else who relies on that person to do that job if that barrier is going to. Do you know what I'm saying? So in yeah, other words, yeah. if, yeah. if, if you have to make a deadline at 5.55 and you know you can't possibly do that, <clears throat> would it not be fair to, to recognize that and maybe realize that's not the job I should be applying for? Or am I wrong? Like, and I could be very wrong, I don't know. No. I, would, I would say just yeah. in those situations, like I've been dealing with mental health my entire life but uh, most recently but again health is most important um, I would just say you know I'm a very open person um, so and even if I like you might not be that open but even like if you're having a bad mental health day or physical day whatever it may be you don't have to go deep into it you can say, you know, I'm just having a sad day, a bad day, or I just don't think I can meet it. Like, 
it's no one's business but your own what's going on. Um, but if it's going to affect, you know, a deadline or something, you don't have to say, well, my dog died so I'm feeling depressed and this and that and that. You can just say, you know, I'm having a really bad day. I don't think I can make that deadline. Is there a way we can work together to make it together or if I can team up? Like, cause like they were saying, like if a boss is going to lay you off or say, you know, like maybe you shouldn't have the job just because you may have some type of illness, like when it, they're not a boss to work for. But everyone I've met personally in the radio industry is very understanding of any type of illness and they will work with you. But that's also, as Sheila was saying, you have to be open to a certain extent. Um, again, you don't have to say, well, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was four years old and this and this and this and that. Cause you know, you might not even like, like they don't need to know that, but you can say I have an, a, like an illness that affects me in this way. And they don't need to know what it is unless you really want to open up to them, maybe become friends down the line. But, you know, you can say, I have an illness, this is what it can affect, I just want to put it out there. They don't need to know the details, they don't know if you're on medication or what's going on, because that's none of their business. It's kind of a matter, just so everyone, also so you feel comfortable and you don't feel like you're hiding something in the workplace, just so they know, kind of, if they hire you, you know, they know, okay, they might not be able to work after this time or or they might not be able to do this just so it's fair on both parts because I know from personal experience when you don't talk about it it makes it worse and just even if you have that one person in the office to talk to at the same time is great but definitely let your boss know because I've to be honest I've never had a boss that's an asshole as of yet um, so if you just let them know in a general way they're not insensitive in a way that they'll be like well you have an illness on to the next one like they're not like that well and they so, might also be able to offer support that exactly and they might be there. able to okay. work around what the task at hand is needed from you if that so, makes sense so, so so maybe you go in figuring out solutions to yeah like problems, it's just like, like, like any workspace you just work with the team you're given to figure out the best way for all the work to get done basically it's pretty evident that as you go into the industry, whether you're interning or working a full-time job, you will get those people that don't know how to play nice in the sandbox. Now, whether this has happened to you or not, how did you address those issues that came across with that person? Or what advice would you have for us if we were ever put in that position? Uh, I haven't, I haven't really had any main issues with, with people, with coworkers, but I, my honest advice would be don't let anybody distract you from your past. I mean, if you get caught up in in work drama or uh, a, a coworker who's just mean or nasty, you know, uh, address them once and keep it moving because, I mean, all they're doing is, is distracting and taking away from the job that you need to do, right? And we're human. I get it, right? Like, I mean, if somebody is, is, is going to bother you or present an issue, to, issue um, you're going to you're gonna react sometimes, right? But also recognize where you are, recognize the space that you're at, and again, don't allow um, anybody to distract you from the goals that you need to do because that's all that person is doing. They're just distracting you. So don't, don't let it happen. And it's hard to do that, but just keep telling yourself that. It's just constant repetition. I'd, I'd say the same thing. I mean, I, I, you know, never really had any rivals or anything like that. But, you know, I can remember starting and uh, when, I, when I was a, an intern and then, you know, when I first started going full time, I'd hear the odd time, you know, some of the more experienced reporters make reference to the fact that, you know, I was I was green, um, you know, meaning that I was still a newbie and still learning and yeah, I am green and I am still learning. So I'm, I didn't take offense to it or anything like that. It was, I don't know if it was actually meant as any offense, but it could be a bit of, sometimes people get intimidated by the, the young new people coming along. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't pay it any, any mind, unless it's something that's actually affecting you mentally or physically, if you feel like you're being bullied or something like that. But otherwise, you know, there's, especially when you're all working for the same station, you're all on the same team. If I do well, you do well. We do well. Yeah. So there's no point making feuds or, or anything like that. Just if someone's being mean in whatever variety that comes from, just just let it slide. Yeah, just to bounce off basically everything they were saying. But 
also if someone's negative in the workplace even if it's just towards you there's always people around and I always say fake it till you make it even if you're dying in your deathbed you look good doing great um, so as long as you take it with a grain of salt and just know that okay they're just a nasty person they probably are nasty for a reason but you know what your boss might notice that and then that's their job on the line so kind of don't like Shem was saying it's uh, it's gonna distract you from your job so just kind of focus on your job if it gets to a point where it's really distracting address them and then if it's if it gets to such a bad point that like you just feel like you can't do your job then you would just go to your PD and let them know just because no one deserves to be at any workplace and not feel like they can do their job properly and well because someone else is making it a hell for them but again like they said I've personally never experienced that of yet so but yeah just kind of let them dig their own grave as I always say and if they're gonna be an asshole about it then they won't have a job in a couple months I know that sounds terrible um, but it's just like the reality of any job like if people are gonna want nice people over people who are just not very nice at all so it's true whereas with the news it feels like you run the risk of getting pigeonholed a little bit more yeah. so how do you how do you avoid that how do you you know still put yourself out there and say I'm willing to do different things but it's like once you kind of take your foot off of that news boat not so easy to get it back in. Yeah, I and I, I know that from experience. Um, having having you know done the news pathway here, and even uh, when I first started, um, you know, just trying to, I was open to maybe still working at, at a music station, maybe doing some announcing too, and I was looking for jobs, and I kind of felt pigeonholed too. And I, you know what? I, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't really know how to escape it. Um, I mean, in the end, news was the main thing I wanted to do, so it, it was okay to me. Um, I, yeah, it, it, was, it was a struggle. I mean, I tried to do as much as I could here. Like, you know, uh, I was doing news. I had a little segment on the sports drive as well that gave me a bit of announcing and stuff like that. Um, I didn't do any announcing on the station because there were so many kids that wanted to do announcing. There was no way to fit me into the announcing schedule, right? Um, but I, I think the best advice I could give you uh, is probably, and it's something that I would still look to do uh, too at some point in my career too. Again, it goes back to the fact that you have the power to make your own thing, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not, if you're not doing everything you want to do while you're out there, um, you can make your own podcast of, of whatever you want to do, right? It, it, it becomes now, it, it becomes a little hard when you work in a station in sort of a corporate environment. Um, like for instance, uh, one of the camera guys that I work with, he and I wanted to create our own podcast. Uh, and then we sort of decided it's probably not a good idea because we work for a big company and, uh, you know, they may not like that, mm. right? Uh, we didn't pursue it to see if they actually would. So, yeah, I'm having a hard time answering your question. Uh, that's a good question, damn. Um, I, I would say, especially now, because you're, you know, you're, you're sort of still... Um, new and fresh to all this and, and you don't really have you know a connection yet with a full-time job I'm, I'm assuming right yeah. um, now is is the best time to you know if you if you want to do something aside from news uh, while still doing news now's the best time to to make your own thing you know um, and just because you're doing news doesn't mean you can't have a personality or, or be an announcer of some sort too right and Anderson Cooper hosted a game show for Pete's sake. Right? Oh, that's true. And, yeah. and New Year's Eve and all that stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you recommend does, yeah. like maybe her starting her own like branding in some aspect. But that could also hurt me as a news person in the same breath, right? What? We're based on facts and yeah. you know we have to be really reliable and starting your own thing you have to be very mindful but of what you're could, starting. I mean, well, of course for anything. If you look yeah. like someone like Barbara Walters, mm -hmm. right? She ha she is somebody who could kind of emulate, right? Yeah. Right. Am I right, Mark? Like, yeah. where you know, she's a she's a newswoman, mm -hmm. but she also hosts, you know, fluffy specials, yeah. and uh, she was on a talk show, and so I mean, you you could, but you'd have to establish your brand, I think, before you before sell you it to that. other people. Yeah, you I guys mean, think that? you you could you could work in news and still do something else where you have a bit more of a personality and all that. You just probably. You know, I wouldn't advise that maybe you swear in that content yeah. or, or, you know, don't 
don't say anything that's that's not truthful. Uh, you know, I understand you might want to take an opinion on some things. I think it's okay to have an opinion on a, on a separate show, but not, you know, not not sort of a. Nothing affiliated with the company. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, but I think if you wanted to do something, now is the right time to do it in terms of making your own stuff. Did I answer your... your I, don't feel, I don't feel happy with my question. Can we rewind? No, it's tough. No, it's, 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 yeah, it's a tough question. Yeah, it is. Especially it is. with the news. I feel like it is its own, it's its own ship. I struggled with it, too. Uh, I, I, sorry, just to, one more thing. You know, when I was working at, at 1010, uh, I wanted to pitch a story... Uh, that's not a story, sorry, a show a music-based show uh, that would have been like a, a, a new rock show. I just wanted to do like a one-hour pre-taped show that would air Sunday nights, and I pitched it to all the rock stations uh, across the, the Astral Radio network. And uh, I, a lot of the feedback I got was, well, you know, you're, you're a news guy. Even my own program director was like, well, why would anyone want a news guy to do a music show? Yeah. Because I'm more than a news guy, I thought, right? So it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Do you guys ever have like I guess like fun within the station itself, or do you just find that you you guys all are are all like off doing your own things and you never really talk to each other at all? Well, I work in the smallest station I've ever seen. It's smaller than this room. Yeah. Um, we have a studio, a newsroom, my promotions desk, a kitchen, all in the same room. I know. How does that work? Small. It's very small, but it's very functional. Um, and that kind of forces us in that situation. But when I was working out in Newfoundland, we had the different offices, but everyone was friends. We had pizza parties every Friday. It might not be like that everywhere. Yeah. Um, but it's not, I guess it's not as cold as you think within the office. And there is really a community. And people, you know, really do gel. And you might, if you're coming from like the Rogers building, which has like hundreds of people, you might not gel with all hundred people. But there's people within your station or other stations that you're going to find you really gel with and talk with. And there's always communities within the community, if that makes sense. The mine's a kind of unique situation where we're only one room and all the different people are in the same room. Um, and we do have times where work has to be done. It's a business and no one talks unless you're on air and we're just doing our work. But a lot of the times we're just goofing off and having a good radio time, as I like to say, so. Good. You guys, anything to add? I think, yeah, at, at Global, I mean, the camera guys are some of my best friends, uh, at and outside of work. Um, and the, the reporters, too. I mean, everyone kind of gets along well. Um, I think the, the best sort of um, gelling that I had was when I was at 1010, there was a lot of, you know, reporters, producers, uh, a lot of people working behind the scenes. It was just the right time where we were all kind of in our early 20s, we were all single, so we'd go out and, and party often together. There was a bar called Scallywags right across the street that's still there that uh, holds many stories, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's everyone likes to have a, a, a good time with their coworkers. I've never had an experience where I find it to be kind of rigid. There's the odd person who might be rigid. Uh, that might go back to them being an extrovert, I guess. Yeah. An introvert, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't um, you know, your coworkers are, are going to end up being the people you see the most. You're going to see them more than your family, you know. So uh, you end up becoming friends pretty fast. You know, you're all you're all kind of in it together. So there there are fun times to be had at work and outside of work too. Yeah, I think uh, I work in a very corporate company, Rogers, um, and honestly, everybody's everybody's really cool. Uh, maybe it's because I have my my hat I have so many different hats that I get to work with so many different departments so I kind of know pretty much everybody but I also think that there's this thing to um announcers are sort of this is weird social hierarchy right where announcers are viewed as being like oh my god they're announcers um and then um I think if you're an announcer so long as you don't have this attitude that you're here and everybody else promotions and sales and all are down here as long as you don't have that kind of mentality and I can honestly say Nobody in the building now that I work at has that sort of mentality, at least on at least on KISS. Can't speak for 680 CHFI or for that. <laughs> um, but at least at KISS, like none of us view people who work in promotions any differently because we need everybody to kind of make, make the station work, right? So everybody's pretty cool. We do some very wild, inappropriate things that I would never reveal now, but um, <laughs> some wild conversations happen. Let me tell you, it's good, it's good. Real good, real good. So final piece of advice, they're finished in five weeks, I think 
everybody, mostly everybody, um, what uh, what words of wisdom can you bestow upon them? I, go ahead. You had some good stuff at the. I'll tell you what you said at the yeah. beginning. You <laughs> I said, was, I was um, say that. Uh, "Don't be picky." Get foot in the door, Mark. Yep. Uh, don't compare yourself to your other classmates. A chef, make your own way. Ask for help. And Tori, uh, be helpful and don't burn bridges. So, anything additional to that, or? Uh, I would say you can, you can honestly really take advantage of these facilities that you guys have, and I'm telling you, like they're really, you, you will you will come to miss them. Uh, believe it or not, you will come to miss the opportunity to kind of jump into a studio and record a break or record something. So use them. And as I said, you have you have professionals, whether it's you know recent grads who come in and speak to you, but you also in, in your teachers who are all in the industry or have been in the industry, you know, use them, right? I mean, I'm sure you'll take some of our contact information. If you need help with a, with a demo or whatever the case is, just flip us a note, you know? Um, I, uh, I know sometimes it can be frustrating when you reach out, to people, reach out to people in the industry and they don't hear back. I can say for myself, I, I never go 24 hours without replying back to somebody because I know how annoying that is because I've been in that same position. Um, but it's like, so all good. It's <laughs> so all good. I get it. I, 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 uh, I uh, was listening to a demo just last night from a former Harvard grad. Um, but as I said, just use. You have so many tools that are literally just being handed to you, and and the mistake a lot of people make is that they don't use them for whatever reason. I don't know, but use them. Yeah. Use them. Good. I would say to bounce off what Shem said, using your. I know this sounds terrible. Use your professors. Use the facilities. I lived here for the two years I was here. Like, I barely saw my mom. Uh, I don't think I had dinner at my house for almost two years. I was always here, living here. Uh, Aki Tree was my best friend. Hey. It was delish. Um, <laughs> <house. laughs> <laughs> um, I just don't like to walk, that's my that's issue. Not. Getting up here was you a struggle with the elevator. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just use your professors and let them know what you want to do because by me telling, I basically told everyone and anyone who listened to me that I love promotions. I used to be one of the promotions assistants for now Ignite, but it was HSF. Um, and I did promotions, so pretty much all the professors knew that's what I did. So anytime a promo job would come up, Neil would be like, here's the email for the contact, email them. Kyle Taylor was the one who got me the job at Indy 88. He was like, just shoot her an email, tell her I sent you, and it's a done deal. And it was a done deal. Like I obviously had an interview, but it was kind of more of a I want to meet you just to, to let you know you have the job, but also just to make sure that like you're not just like a sham that Kyle's setting up us like a prank, like a punk type thing. Um, he would, he would do it, yeah. But yeah, he would. Um, but you know, like let not only just use them and the knowledge they have, but also let them know what you want to do because down the line, like right now, I'm looking for a cruiser, summer cruiser person. Uh, if anyone's interested, hi. Um, hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, license? Oh, she sure oh, I can make it happen. <laughs> if you make it happen by May, we could have a deal. Um, but yeah, like just let everyone know. Anyone who listened, just let them know. Even your classmates. I've had classmates. One of my very good friends, Ken, who is like a legend here. Maybe, he may, maybe he's not a legend. I don't know if you know him, but um, he's at West, and he called me every two months, being like, "So this job opened up. I think you should work here. I need more friends out here." And you know, doing that one move to Newfoundland, I taught myself that you know, that's not for me. But just letting your classmates know, like, hey, I want to be an announcer. This is the type of music. And just them knowing, too. Because, you know, like, Mark can have a job before me, though we were in the same class, theoretically. And maybe Mark hears, oh, there's a position opening at my station. And they know, you know what? Tori w would be really good for that job. So not even just your professors, but remind your classmates who you are, what you want to do, because they can take you far, too. Cool. And Mark, what do you have to say? I, I think, you know, you guys have heard it a million times already, just don't give up, right? Take any opportunity you can and don't get discouraged. I mean, this is intimidating, but it's, it's exciting too. It's an exciting time in your life because the world is your, is your oyster. I can't say that enough. There's so many opportunities there. Don't just pigeonhole yourself into trying to get an internship in Toronto. Why, you know, internships are great, but why be an intern in Toronto when you can be a announcer or newscaster in Halifax, in Moncton? in Winnipeg, whatever. Um, you know, just keep your eyes open for anything and everything. Uh, be nice to, to people and, and your classmates. 
because you never know, you know, not just from the perspective of, of using them for opportunities, but you never know when they might be able to help you out, like Tori said. Mm -hmm. And good luck. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.